It is perhaps no surprise that something as slippery as fish is proving so difficult to handle. But when it matters little to the UK economy overall, why could fishing rights still sink a Brexit deal with the European Union? This is Roundtable. Welcome to the programme. I'm David Foster. Maybe it's being an island nation. Perhaps it's all that old Britannia rules the waves stuff. But whatever the reasons for not so far landing a deal, fishing rights could yet prove a breaking point. Yet this is an industry that accounts for just one tenth of one percent of the UK's GDP. As the clock counts down to the end of the UK's transition period, the future of fishing is fraught. For supporters of Brexit, the right for British boats to fish in British waters is a symbol of sovereignty that will be regained. The EU wants to keep access to UK waters as part of any trade agreement. According to official statistics, fishing was worth $1 billion to the UK economy in 2017, to the EU as much as $6 billion. All this is complicated by the fact that parts of the British quota have been sold off by British fishermen to boats based elsewhere in the European Union. EU members France, the Netherlands and Belgium warn that their coastal communities risk being devastated by Brexit. And an agreement on the 100 categories of fish swimming in EU-UK waters remains tenuous But fishing represents only 0.1% of the UK's gross domestic product and 0.04% of the country's workforce. So why has fishing turned into such a big part of the fight over trade? And I'm pleased to say we can head first to York in England. Say hello to Barry Dees, Chief Exec of the National Federation of Fishermen's Organisations across the city. Uh, Bryce Stewart, marine ecologist and fisheries biologist at the University of York. And then we go to Den Helder in the Netherlands and welcome Pim Visser, president of the European Association of Fish Producers Organizations. Um, Barry, let me come to you first of all. Already I have laid out how little in terms of monetary value fishing contributes to the UK economy. So why is it possible that this entire deal could go down because of something that is actually so small? Well, I think that fishing is <clears throat> very important uh, regionally, um, but I think um, probably more significant in political terms is that it's um, it's almost become emblematic of of uh, the UK's departure from the EU. Um, the fishing industry got a very bad deal back in 1974 um, in the entry terms to the EEC, and I think that that um, that is understood in um, in the cabinet, um, across parliament, um, and across the public. And there's, um, there's an opportunity um, that is seen, uh, I think, in the UK side, uh, that this is an opportunity to fix things, to, to make things better, to turn things around. I think the EU side has had um, <clears throat> the advantage for about 40 years, and there's an opportunity here for uh, us to act as a, a, an independent coastal state. I think that's widely understood. and so. Um, but can I can I jump in at this point? We're talking about twelve thousand active fishermen, eighteen thousand people associated with the industry, maximum thirty thousand, one million people, for example, in the car industry, and yet they and everybody else in the country could suffer if there's there's no deal, and this comes down to fishing, perhaps. Yeah, but I, I um, also want a deal, a trade deal that's very important for for fishing as well. Uh, both sides will suffer if, if there's no trade deal. Um, but I think it's important to understand that the artificial linkage between trade and fisheries has been made by the EU side to, uh, well, to, gain, uh, to gain leverage in the negotiation. So I think it's very important to understand that trade is important to us, but it shouldn't be linked to fisheries. Uh, let me go to Pim on this one. What happens to fleets across Europe? You're in the Netherlands in particular, so you can talk about the Dutch fleet. What happens to them if the British fishermen, the British government get their way? Well, 
for about 40% of our revenues, the, the Dutch fleet is dependent on fish that's coming from the British waters. But before it came into the British water, it's, it spawned in Danish waters, it grew up in Dutch waters, and then it swam to UK waters. So this North Sea fish, which is uh, being caught in the UK uh, waters by coincidence, uh, that's making, say, 40%. But for some fishing communities who are fishing in, in UK waters for generations, it's, it's up to 70, 80 percent, and for others it's not so important. So there's a, there's a great divergence, but for instance, we have fishermen fishing in the channel, uh, and there's, there's a line right in the middle, with, together with the French fishermen, and they are fishing there very peacefully together, but that could all change dramatically if the UK waters are closed. But using that argument, you could say we can fish anywhere we like, anywhere in the world because we have no idea where these fish started and where they've been in between. It's just where they've ended up and so so what? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm talking specifically about the ecosystem of, of the North Sea, which is, if you look at it from a from a worldwide perspective, it's only a bay and therefore it's a, jo it's a joint water. It's, it's joint waters since the Middle Ages. And yes, we are all entitled to our own national waters, but beyond that, it's it's a joint it's joint waters and we've put pencil stripes on it because we had to divide it. But if you look at that jigsaw, that is a very artificial jigsaw. It's it's one one ecosystem, one economic system. Bryce, let me put this in. Why is everybody so very stubborn about something that appears in in the bigger schemes to be so small? Well, I think actually, um, you know, as Barry said, fishing is regionally very important, but more than that. It is part of the British identity. I mean, it, you know, we're a naval uh, nation. Um, you know, some of the most sort of famous people in history had an association with the sea. And also, if you think about fish and chips being the national dish, um, you can start to understand that, you know, fishing and seafood is very important to the UK. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't, you know, that, that we should be trying to claim everything for ourselves, and I think both um, Barry and Pim have made a, a couple of really good points there about um, yes, the UK did get a, a bit of a bad deal in some instances um, in the way that the quotas were distributed, but we also have to acknowledge that many of the fish stocks are shared. Over a hundred of them um, in European waters are shared between the UK and other countries, and, and actually we do know a lot about the nature of that. We have very good science. Um, European waters are probably the best studied in the sea. So we know, for example, that fish, uh, some of the flat fish like sole and place, they do indeed, um, certainly some of them, um, uh, breed along the coast of the Netherlands and France and places like that, and then grow up and move into the central North Sea and including British waters. But some other species um, spend most of their lives in British waters and so we have to work out how to manage the fisheries according to those those differences between species and in life histories as well. Do you mind if we come to that later on about conserving fish stocks? I, I just want to if go I, back to something that... Yeah, yeah, please. If I, if I may come in on the myth of the bad deal. The bad deal was done in 73 when the UK agreed that the sea would be under a common, a common sea. But when in 1983 the, uh, the, the quota were divided, the UK was granted uh, extra quota because of the loss of the Iceland and, and the far away. So the UK got 26% more quota than it was entitled to in accordance with the, in accordance with the, okay. with the calculations. Pim, Pim so I, I don't want to get myth. too bogged down in myth. numbers here. I, I, OK, I do, but I want to ask you, um, Barry sort of made the point that um, this was making a point if you like, about British independence. Um, is it the same from the European point of view, from your own personal geographical position, from the Dutch point of view? Or is it about economics as far as the Europeans are concerned? No, it's, it's a mixture. It's, it's, about, it's about regional economics. From a GDP point, it's 0.0% or something like that. So it's nothing compared to the automotive industry or, for instance, dairy or beef or any other any other basic basic stock or flowers from the Netherlands, but it's very important for local communities in France, in the Netherlands, in Germany, in Denmark. So 
It is, it's the smaller regional communities where it makes a lot of regional socioeconomics. There, for, for them, it's important. And in that respect, we say it's the rural communities, both on the UK side and on the, on the EU side, that, are, that might suffer from being a bargaining chip in the greater political arena. Uh, Barry, your turn. Well, <clears throat> Bryce's point that, that, uh, and, and Pim's, these are shared stocks. There's um, something like 140 uh, shared stocks. That is not the point. Um, if we look at um, the EU's current relationship with Norway, another uh, country that they share um, stocks with, what we have there is a balanced reciprocal uh, fisheries agreement, annually agreed. Uh, the total allowable catches are based on science. The the shares reflect the resources in each other's waters. Um, the annual negotiations set the access arrangement, so uh, we fish in each other's waters. Uh, that is what we want. That is the international norm in terms of how coastal states uh, work together to sustainably manage fish stocks. It is the current arrangements under the uh, Common Fisheries Policy and in terms of what the EU want to retain, that is uh, the aberration here, that is the outlier. Um, so I think that's what, what it boils down to uh, in the negotiations that are currently coming to a head, is that uh, there is a deal on the table that would give Pym and his members uh, some degree of access to fish in UK waters, but there has to be movement on the quota shares. I mean, for example, in the English Channel uh, COD, the UK share is 9%. The French share is 84%. How can that be right? I can reel off a, a list of quota but, shares. But please, please don't, please don't, because we're trying to look at the bigger picture here. And one, one of the things that I've read in um, trying to get myself slightly up to speed on this question is that a large number of fishing quota are sold by Britain to foreign vessels. Why, why is that? Well, there's, a, there's a number of answers to that, but one important reason, of course, is that the UK was in the, the single market before single. and subject to the treaty obligations on the freedom of movement of labour and capital. Um, and so uh, quotas uh, have been sold to uh, Dutch, to uh, Spanish to Icelandic uh, interests. But, but, but if the British fishermen don't have enough vessels to go out and they're worried that they can't catch enough fish, why don't they keep those quotas for themselves? Well, I think it, uh, it, it's been an individual choice by individual companies uh, to, to maximise the benefit. They've, they've sold the, those quotas. So I think you need to think of it in two levels. You need to think of the, the national shares and then what happens afterwards. Um, and I, th I, I, you know, I'm very happy to enter into a discussion about both those levels. Bryce, let, let's go back to overfishing. Um, if it stays as it is, is there still overfishing? If it changes to what the Brits want, will there be overfishing? What is the, the conservation picture in the North Sea in particular? Yeah, it's a really good question. So one of the things that's important to note is that the common fisheries policy has actually been performing much better over the last decade than it did early on in its history and many fish stocks are recovering. And so what we need to do, regardless of how the quota shares are divvied up, is make sure that we respect the science in terms of the overall limits on how many fish are taken out each year. The danger if there isn't a deal and if each side sort of unilaterally decides to um, you know, take the share that it thinks it deserves, is that you end up, instead of catching, you know, 100% of what's called the total allowable catch, that each side ends up catching 120 or 130 or more percent. And under that situation, we will get overfishing. And this is not just hypothetical. This sort of thing has happened um, because of international just disagreements over the mackerel stock, for example, further north in international waters. And so me as a, as a scientist, and I guess as a conservationist as well, you know, I am concerned about that possibility. And again, it's another reason why, you know, it's important, obviously, to do a trade deal for the economy of, of both uh, entities, but also to do a, a fisheries management deal. Um, and it won't be easy. As Barry said, there's 140 stocks that we share with the EU. And Norway, yes, that's a great model to follow, but... Um, I think we share less than 10 stocks with Norway. So it's it's a completely different ballgame. And 
you know, that's what needs to be worked out. Um, before I come to you, Pim, I'm going to put this quote up on the screen. Uh, Paul Lyons, Fishing for Leave, uh, which is a pro-Brexit group uh, in the UK fishing industry, said, I'm alarmed at how bad the level of foreign ownership really is. It far exceeds my worst expectations. I fear government action will change nothing and we're still going to be dominated by a foreign presence. So, so Pim, why is there such a high level of foreign ownership in the UK? Surely the UK could have as many fish as it wanted if it didn't flog off the licenses. Well, there's, there's, there's two things. Um, in, in, the, in the early 1990s, companies came up for sale and they were up for sale on the free market. And there was no British interest in buying these companies and their quota. And there were Dutch companies who were interested in buying them, especially from the island, former island of Urk. They were place fishermen and they bought these companies with considerable place quota. And what I don't understand is when the likes of Volkswagen and BMW and Nissan, when they bought, uh, when they bought the, the UK car industry, nobody was crying out loud. And now there is a, 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 um, a pelagic trawler with UK company, with a UK crew, with UK flag, and there's, there's others, and, and everybody is crying out loud. And it's only it's, it's it's become very emotional, and we should look at this in a rational way. And it's the economics. And if you can fish, if you can catch your fish in a profitable way, do it. And if you can't do it, let others who can let them do it. That's the reason why I think a lot of quota from England, uh, Demersal England, have been sold to Pelagic Scotland. And that's not I don't give any opinion on that, but that's just what happened. But everything is now being brought back to a very emotional level. And when I'm asking my fishermen, what about the way when they meet their British colleagues, etc., in the North Sea, in the Southern North Sea, they say, we hardly see, we hardly see any. And there's always the, the comparison with the cod quota in, in, the, in, in, in the channel. But I think that the cod, economically, the cod catches are minimal. And if you look at the, in, the interest, the joint interest in the scallop fishery is much bigger. So there's, we should find a way to continue the sustainable exploitation and the sustainable management of the fisheries because it's a zero-sum game. There is just one PAC, and if one of the parties takes more, the other gets less. Barry, let me come back to you on, on, on why once again, because I think it's a vast figure. It could be 80 85 percent of the fish that British fishermen catch. Um, is within British waters anyway. In other words, there, there would be no conflict of interest. These are not open waters or disputed waters. So we're talking about a very small percentage, again, that matters when it comes to these longer-term deals. We're talking about a huge uh, difference. I mean, <clears throat> the EU fleets fish about, uh, in value terms, about five or six times as much in UK waters as uh, the UK fleet fishes in EU waters um, and takes about 60% of, of the, the value of the catch uh, back, uh, it, it is caught by, by EU vessels. So changing that ratio to something that uh, is more acceptable to an independent coastal state, which is uh, what the, the UK will be um, on the 1st of January, is what these negotiations uh, are about. I, I do accept Bryce's uh, point that uh, we sustainability is everything. If you have a shrinking cake, there's not much point arguing about, about the share. So we need to ensure that the, the stocks are fished at sustainable levels. Um, these are shared stocks, so we do need shared management. Uh, but from our point of view, we have to move away from this um, uh, 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 asymmetric, uh, exploitative arrangement that uh, was fixed in the 1970, uh, 1970s, reinforced in the 1983 quota shares agreement, and has worked to the UK's uh, systematic disadvantage ever since. Uh, now, that's but, what but let, 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 Let's not go back to that, if, we do, if you don't mind. I want to ask you this question. Um, since most fish that is landed by UK boats is exported, and a vast majority of that goes to the European Union, you, the fishing industry in the UK, are going to be a great deal worse off if there is no deal than if it remains with what you even consider to be a bad deal that we have at the moment. You will be worse off with no deal. 
I think everybody will be worse off with no deal. I think uh, a trade deal works for everybody. There are member states um, uh, that are very vulnerable to a no deal, as well as the UK. Um, to repeat, but time to give ground, therefore. It's, it's the EU that's made the artificial linkage between trade and, and fisheries. Um, they'll, they'll, uh, my, my belief is that there'll be a deal, um, that there'll, there'll be a deal, but that deal has to recognise that, that things have changed under international law. The UK is a, will be an independent coastal state. The political price uh, for uh, sacrificing uh, the fishing industry again I think would be extremely high for this government. They recognise that. So um, my, my belief is that there will be uh, a good deal for the UK fishing industry. Yeah, so, so you make the point once again, valid point, that it is perhaps political um, and social as well as in terms of the financial costs that it contributes. So Pim, let me come to you. Surely it's time to give ground because no deal would be bad for not just the UK, but, but for the European Union too. Well, no deal is bad for everybody, but as regards of export of fish, most export of our fish from the EU side is within the EU. There is, of course, a little export to the EU, but the, to the UK, but the EU market would easily absorb it. Most imports for, for the UK are coming from, um, most imports for the UK are coming from Iceland and, and, and Norway for their fish and chips. But consider the export, the export value of uh, Scottish salmon. To that, that is huge. So from a trade point of view, there's much more to lose for the UK than for the, and then for the EU. But let alone, we let, the, put that aside. We want a deal. Everybody wants a deal. We want, we want peace of mind. We've been fishing together for ages, and we want to continue that in a peaceful way. Uh, Bryce, we heard from Pim there referencing Iceland. Um, of course, there were in the 1980s major clashes between British boats and Icelandic vessels um, in the North Sea. If there is no real uh, deal reached within, a force, within the foreseeable future, can you see trouble at sea uh, happening again? I mean, I certainly hope not. Um, of course, this, you know, these sorts of things need to be um, sorted out around a negotiating table and not at sea. Uh, but unfortunately, we do have the history of things like the Scallop Wars or the so-called Scallop Wars from a couple of years ago um, uh, around the Bay of Seine. And that was over boats um, sort of fishing the line along each other's waters and allegations that they were, you know, breaking local rules. Um, and, you know, I think that was actually worked out in due course. And... I've, I've seen the French and, and the English fishermen together getting on like a house on fire. You know, they have, uh, I think fishermen have a, a common bond and um, that's what we need to work with, you know, that sort of respect for each other and the difficulty of the job and the fact that, you know, it, this is a shared resource and let's work out how to share it and not okay. settle our differences at sea. Uh Barry, uh, we're coming towards the end of the programme. Sorry to say it's been absolutely fascinating. As a chief executive of the Fishermen's Organisation, can you be certain that UK fishermen and women with their vessels won't take matters into their own hands as, and as has been done before? I, I don't think this is something for um, fleet to fleet to, to sort um, each other out. I think Bryce is right. This has to be sorted out around the negotiating table. Um, I think what we're in is a difficult situation moving up to uh, a change, to a new equilibrium, and that's going to be difficult. And there might be um, short-term problems thereafter. But uh, what the Cod War uh, tells us, the Cod Wars tell us, is that things settle down very quickly. OK, Pim, let me come to you last of all on, on this one. You, you, you say you're hoping for a deal. Are you expecting one in which both sides will end up equally satisfied? Maybe. Let's hope that everybody ends up equally dissatisfied because then it's a good, uh, then it's, then it's, then it's a good deal. And I don't think there will be clashes between the fleets and we need to sort this out. Barry and I know each other for, 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 for over 15 years now, working together to the sustainable management of the fisheries. And we need to keep that system alive, that we manage our fisheries sustainably, both economically and ecologically, for the benefit of the fisheries communities, both in the UK side and the EU side. 
and that's a joint obligation. And will such a small industry always be such a big sticking point? I don't know. Maybe, well, if you look at when, when, when Farage was going up the Thames, it actually made a, it made a, huge, uh, a huge impression. That's what, it, that's what it made. And I think it's more an emotional thing on the UK side than on the Dutch side. Listen, thank you very much indeed. I, I know you are friends away from uh, your professional commitments, and I do hope that everything does stay, um, well, as peaceful as it is possible to be, and that we can all continue to enjoy the wonderful fish that we produce in and around our waters. Uh, Barry, thank you very much indeed. Bryce, much appreciated. And also, Pim, thanks for coming on. Uh, thank you, wherever you happen to be right. watching this edition of Roundtable. I'm David Foster. We hope to have your company on another occasion. Until then, goodbye.